would you like to improve your health and keep your family safe? You're listening to the Healthy Home Hacks podcast, where we firmly believe enjoying optimal health shouldn't be a luxury. Healthy Home Authorities and husband and wife team, Ron and Lisa, will help you create a home environment that will level up your health. It's time to hear from the experts. Listen in on honest conversations and gain the best tips and advice. If you're ready to dive in and improve your well being and increase your energy, you're in the right place. All right, here are your hosts bow biologists, authors, media darlings, vicarious vegans, and avocado aficionados, Ron and Lisa Barris. Hey guys, welcome back to the Healthy Home Hacks podcast. Today's show kicks off season three and our 53rd episode. And we thank you for being part of it. One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well, Virginia Woolf. Guys, love is in the air. Yep, guys and gals, Valentine's Day is right around the corner and we've got you, your sweetheart, and your heart covered. In fact, did you know, according to surveys by the National Retail Foundation, American consumers plan to spend a whopping $21.8 billion on Valentine's Day in 2021. Men spent an average of $231, while women plan to spend an average of approximately $101. So what do they spend all of that hard-earned dough on, you ask? It turns out 24% of the people spent money on eating out, while a whopping 41% spent money on a special celebration or dinner at home. Let's face it, eating out is fun. You know, Lisa and I used to dine out all the time. In fact, I don't think we had a piece of food in our refrigerator, but cooking in, you can be so much more romantic. It's the aromas, the flavors, you're making something for your loved one. You can't beat it. I agree, Ron. And as they say, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. I can personally attest friends <laughs> with my husband. So if you're feeling the cozy, stay in and cook for your sweetie kind of vibe, then you'll love today's show. And by the way, this isn't just if you have a sweetie. So gal celebrating Galentine's, if you're single, you can treat yourself, okay? Or your friend or your mama, anyone. <laughs> But today we're dishing up healthy recipes and decadent desserts from our special guest. Now, don't worry if you're new to cooking or intimidated behind the apron. She is going to share heart healthy and easy peasy secrets and recipes that will have your bay swooning. Chef Maria Ibrahim is also known as the Fit Foodie, a nationally recognized food safety and clean eating expert, an award-winning entrepreneur, television chef, author and inventor. She is the CEO and founder of Grow Green Industries and the patented co-creator of the Eat Cleaner, Eat Safe, and Eat Fresh lines of all natural and organic products that help offer cleaner, safer, longer lasting produce. That's right. And if you like food and you like your health, you don't want to miss today's episode. Maria is a lifestyle nutrition expert, a celebrity chef, and author of the book, Eat like you give a fork, the real dish on eating to thrive. Welcome to the show, Chef Maria. Welcome. Wow, what an introduction. I want to be on your show all the time. Well, be careful what you wish for, Chef Maria. (laughs) Come back. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are so excited. Thank you. So, you know, I'm a cook of our household and I can tell listeners it's never too late to get comfortable behind the stove. I believe I started in my late thirties. I had no idea what I was doing. I couldn't yeah. boil an Our egg. pots and pans were dusty. <laughs> get up, we had a pot rack and people would come over and go, why is there dust all over your pots? Oh, oh we, had, we had we pots and pans. Them. I didn't even know we had them. <laughs> yeah, we had them. We just didn't use them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's dive right in. Okay, so Chef Maria, you're an expert in healthy living, even on a holiday, which I totally agree with. So why is there nothing more seductive than cooking for your sweetheart? And why is it important to care about their heart too? Oh, this is, to me, food is the ultimate love language, right? It's the thing that you can engage with all five senses. And when you take time and you do things with intention, you feel it, you feel it, you taste it, you experience it on so many levels. I remember when I was growing up, 
I'm Middle Eastern, come from a family that every single celebration was around what was happening in the kitchen. (laughs) And the love that we shared and that connection with each other through the food, but also just gathered around the table, looking at each other eye to eye, you know, without distractions, having wonderful conversations, laughing, taking our time. I mean, there are no better memories. And that remains true today. Every day, I feel like if I don't have a chance to sit down with my husband and my kids to actually eat, something's missing. Yeah. And that connection that we nurture, especially on a holiday like Valentine's Day, and I love what you said, it's not just about like your significant other, it's for your kids, for your mama, your 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 child. It's really about love and connection, no matter who that person is to you. And when we can sit down with a beautiful meal that we hand created or better yet cooked together, that is a beautiful thing. Oh, that's Uh, a great point. Are you the only chef in the house or is your husband a good cook or how about your kids? Let's just say my husband husband is a good cook, but he defers to me 99% of the time. (laughs) And what's great is my kids are actually kind of following in my footsteps and they love to cook and do when they have time, love to take that effort. My daughter is in college now and she'll send me pictures, you know, what she made for her roommates. In her dorm, she's got her little, uh, (laughs) yeah, yeah. that's so funny. I love what you said that food is love. Ron and I, even though in the beginning of our marriage, we really truly didn't cook. We ate out a lot and it actually did help us become foodies because we got to learn about all kinds of different flavors and things that we wouldn't have known how to make. And we are definitely foodies. We're vegan, but we can tell good spices. And we always say, oh, this food was made with love. Or maybe it wasn't. Sometimes you get an entree at a restaurant and you're like, yeah, you know, that chef did not make this with love. You can tell when something was thrown together. but It is a gift you give to people, the art of cooking and the love that goes into preparing, whether it's even baking or cooking. I think it's spectacular. Yeah. And of course, I love restaurateurs and by no means am I dissuading people from enjoying their local restaurant. I want to support our chefs. But there is a difference when you're cooking for 80 guests versus one. (laughs) I wouldn't be happy if I was cooking for 80. No. (laughs) And yeah, I think when it comes to romance and actually doing something like this with intention, creating an atmosphere and an environment that is romantic and seductive that goes along with that is something that you can control versus, you know, perhaps sitting next to somebody who is having a conversation you don't necessarily want. <laughs> yeah, or the, or the not so great table spot in the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next to the bathroom, you know, <laughs> set your own mood, so to speak. And also, the thing I th- I really love about cooking is you get to control the ingredients. You get to know what the source of your proteins are and how your fresh fruits and vegetables were handled. Fresh is right. You want to make sure it is clean. That is absolutely. Yeah. Right. Fran's a picky chef. Fran's very picky with pretty much I all organic, non GMO, and we're vegan. So a lot of effort goes into all of that. And of course, when you go out, you know, you're not going to be able to get that all the time, especially the genetically modified ingredients. You kind of have to assume that everything has that in there unless they specify that it doesn't. So that's a things and how much oil they're using, what kind of oil they're using. I mean, when you cook, you get to be the chef of your own kitchen in every respect, from how it tastes to your health. And I think we just need to help uh, demystify and Make it simple. I like to say the kiss approach. Keep it simple and sexy. Ooh, and, oh, I love I thought that. You were going to say stupid. That. Okay, that's, that's, that's perfect for <laughs> Valentine's Day, Maria. Kiss. Okay, what is it again? Kiss, kiss, kiss. The kiss approach. Keep it simple and sexy. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Okay, I love it. Well, good segue. Let me ask. We'll add one more thing because I think this is important for everybody listening. When you talked about the special bond that you create when you have dinner together as a family. So this going back, it's okay if you don't have kids, it's just whoever that is your family, your extended family, whatever. But do you feel like that's kind of breaking in today's society that there isn't as much like gathering around the table and that 
we need to work on that more as a society, making that time because people are so distracted and on their phones and they want to just eat in front of their computer or their TV. Sure. I mean, I think the last couple of years have taught us how to slow down, whether we like it or not. And if there's anything that we can take from that experience is to hold on to that. You have to make that time sacred. You know, it's just like anything that's important, whether it's exercise or meditation and prayer or sleep. I mean, anything that we know is important and really vital for our health and well-being is something that we need to carve out time for. And the truth is, food is survival. It's not just a nice to have. As humans, we're kitchen magicians. We're alchemists. We can take something that comes from nature and turn it into something beautiful. And I think that is a gift that we get to enjoy every day. And if we can do it with the people that we love, mm-hmm. more serotonin for yeah. everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Down and enjoy it and connect. It's really important for our vital well being. Yeah. I think so too. So if you're listening, you're not having dinner together with your family, carve that time out. I grew up every day, five o'clock. We sat around the table every day without a doubt. We never, ever, ever sat in front of the TV and neither do Ron and I, like if we're having dinner, even if we're eating something in the living room, we'll put music on because I feel like it's, I don't know, conscious eating too, right? You want to be conscious of the food you're eating and have that gratitude toward it and not always, always be distracted and be on. Yeah, I think we've, come into a time where every little moment needs to be filled with something, right? Yeah, right. And screen time is just, it's such a, not only a distraction, I think it can be the thief of joy in a lot of ways. And when you're with people, that should be your screen, right? That should be what you're paying attention to. And also really experiencing food and tuning into the flavors and the texture, eating slowly so that you die your food right yeah down, and therefore you're also not overeating what ends up happening is people when they're on the go or they're distracted by something else tend to eat a lot faster or gulp down their food and that affects digestion which then affects so many other things that can lead to poor health mm-hmm. so slow down <laughs> Yeah. I feel like you're looking at me uh, chef Moran. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, he does I, eat fast I, sometimes you know I think it was funny I studied in Italy and I made an Italian friend and we were having dinner one night and he said, you know, you Americans, you eat too fast. (laughs) (laughs) And that was a long time ago, by the way, this was like 20 something years ago. Imagine now. Yeah. And it's true. You see people eating their car on the way to this, that, or the other. There's no intentionality there. And therefore there's not a whole lot of joy. It's more of a chore. Yeah. I guess I'm a geek that way. <laughs> no, it's great. It's like I made a beautiful lunch and ate it myself today. Yeah. <laughs> like I was alone. Wow. I, I love enjoyed it. it. I enjoyed making it. I enjoyed savoring it, the colors, looking at it, smelling wow. it. Wow. Yeah. And that to me is where we connect with not only what is tasting good for us, but what is fueling our DNA. Yeah. And our genetic code because we can upgrade or downgrade with every bite. Ooh. Oh, okay. I like that's, it. A, that's a sound bite, Maria. That is a sound uh, bite. <laughs> <laughs> upgrade well, or downgrade with every bite. Well, hashtag. Of, <laughs> that's hashtag. You're right about that. Well, Valentine's Day falls smack dab in the middle of the American Heart Health Month. In Chinese philosophy, the heart chakra is called the Sea of Qi, and it's responsible for the vital energy flowing through the entire body. So, Chef Maria, can you give us some heart healthy options to cook for your sweetheart that are not only delicious, but that are nutritious, heart healthy, and only take one pan or pot to prepare. Can you think of one? Let, let Ron's the kind of meal. Ron's kind of meal. <laughs> I don't know, like dishes. I don't know. Who does, right? I mean, I think, I think we could all agree, everyone on this listening. I mean, who wants pots and pans in the sink? That's annoying. Well, for me, the pots and I'll cook, just somebody else do the dishes. I can't, it's just like the one thing that drives me crazy. Well, that's so, the hardest part. again how do we keep it simple and sexy for people and one pot meals or one pan meals are really where it's at let me just start by saying number one you want to try and include foods that feed your heart right and the color red not coincidentally is our signal because red signals that a food contains lycopene and lycopene is a powerful antioxidant 
that helps to oxygenate the blood and help to keep our ticker talking. So choosing foods like tomatoes and red bell peppers and red chard and red berries, raspberries and strawberries and watermelon, things like that, that are the color red are always a great thing to defer to. Number two is foods that are rich in omega-3s, omega-3 fatty acids that also help to keep our cardiovascular system healthy. And that can come from seeds like flaxseed and chia seeds. It can come from all kinds of different plant-based oils. It can also come from seafood that's fatty like salmon and sardines and things of that nature. And then greens. Greens are something that we can all adopt easily that benefits so many different systems, but they're full of phytonutrients that help to, again, keep our cells healthy, keep that mitochondria intact and keep our cells from degrading and oxidizing. Finally, one more just quick tip. The good news is chocolate. Whoa, yes. Timely. Our healthy food filled with magnesium and selenium and other vital minerals. But the caveat there is you want to make sure that it's at least 70% or more unsweetened cacao that's in your chocolate. Thank you. Hallelujah. You're preaching to the choir, Chef Maria. We are, yeah, yeah, that's all we, well, that's not all we eat. (laughs) That's all we eat in terms of chocolate. Yeah, the vegan chocolate, basically. You have to get used to it. For those that are used to like a sweeter chocolate, it just takes a little bit of retraining. And I actually talk about retraining your taste buds in my book, in detail, because we talk about all these heart healthy things, but some people are like, you're going to make me eat a grain yeah. or yeah. a vegetable? Like, <laughs> you're I know. mean. <laughs> I know. Isn't that funny? I've heard people, oh, I don't like guacamole because it's green. I'm like, well, have you had it? Like, it's the most amazing thing in the whole wide world. One of my favorite foods of all. And so people will just judge a food by its color, <laughs> literally. Right. But, and, you know, I think once we can kind of get over our own phobias around food, and a lot of them can be pretty deep rooted, we can then open up our palates to crave differently and allow ourselves a chance to retrain our brain through our taste buds. And that is something that you can do in a matter of just a couple of weeks. So it's just being open to that. Going back to Ron, what you were saying about like, how do you do this simply? Well, I created a recipe for this that would be really easy for people to take and make their own. And it's cooking in parchment paper. In French, it's called en papier. It's very fancy for a parchment little envelope. And you can- Wait, what is it called again? Papier. Papier. So you buy it? You buy the parchment paper? Like Yeah, you buy just a roll of parchment paper, take the parchment paper, and you can make a little, think of it like a little love bundle, little, (laughs) and in that, I love to cook fish, but if you're not a fish eater, you can do vegetables, you can do tempeh, you can do a cauliflower steak. All of those different types of preparations work in parchment paper. But the beautiful thing about parchment is number one, it helps to protect your sheet pan so it doesn't get dirty. Yeah, we use it all the time. Yeah. (laughs) And I'll add listeners, if you're using nonstick cookie sheets, this is a great way to repurpose those because the parchment paper will create that barrier between your food until you are ready to dispose of your non-toxic, toxic, I mean, your non-stick toxic sheet and get a stainless steel or something healthier. Yeah. And the great thing about cooking in a parchment envelope is that, or a bundle, is that it helps you keep the steam in. So if you layer, for example, a recipe that I prepared for people to try out for Valentine's Day is a Greek style wild cod and do it Greek style because we let it marinate in a little ouzo. What, what is ouzo? Ouzo is a wonderful Greek liqueur and it kind of is reminiscent of fennel, the taste of fennel. So let it sit in the ouzo with some fresh lemon juice and some spices and absorbs that gorgeous flavor. And then when cook it, it's just ever so slightly there in the flavor, but it just helps to also absorb some of the fishy flavor. And you cook that. I love to do it on a bed of cauliflower rice. So as a vegan, omit the fish, do the cauliflower rice and the vegetables on top. And we add onions and garlic and 
You can do little slivers of red bell pepper, adding the red in, or you can for do our blood. You taught us that red is for blood, right? The blood flow, okay. heart, heart. Okay. Or sun dried tomatoes are great. And then you package it all up, bake it in the oven for 25 minutes and you open the packet and the smell and the steam. It's just a beautiful presentation as well as simple thing to prepare that basically takes care of itself in the oven. Wow. Okay. So explain how we make this envelope. We take the parchment paper, we have a sheet. Is it complicated? No, not at all. (laughs) Is it like origami? (laughs) Teaching this on a Facebook live. Okay. Day. Uh, so, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. I'll put a link. Yeah, so you can actually watch me do it step by step, but you basically just layer everything on the inside of a, a little sheet about a foot wide by a foot long. And then you fold the two ends over and then you take the sides and you twist them almost like a little tissue paper package. Like if you were going to wrap a little package and twist the ends. Oh, okay. right. Yeah. Twist and so that the inside stays nice and tight with a little, almost like just like a little, a tent, like a little roof this stays in there. Okay. So it looks like a little package. And would you take whatever the entree is going to be, the cauliflower or the fish, and then just put it in there? You're not cooking anything before this point. You're just, no, oh, oh. that's oh. simple. Wow. And it just sits in the oven. How long would you bake that? 25 minutes. 25 minutes on. At- at 350. 350. Is 350 the rule of thumb with cooking is pretty much if you don't know what to do? No, I mean, I like, <laughs> I like them a little lower with fish just so that it doesn't dry out. Oh, okay. Um, a white fish like cod, which isn't as fatty as salmon, for example. I like the low heat with that. And then that gives it a chance to kind of mingle with all the other ingredients and okay. the cauliflower rice so that it's nice and cooked also. It's just the perfect kind of combination. Yeah, that sounds like the art of the temperature. I mean, I'd never even really thought about how and broiling and boiling and all of, I should say broiling. Ron and I love broiling, right? Yeah, we yeah really just kind of finish it off. Yeah. Yeah, we do that with our artich- our grilled artichokes and that. Now, I have a personal question on cauliflower steak. Ron and I have tried to make cauliflower and we're terrible at it. It always comes out too hard. What's the secret to getting a good cauliflower? Is do you steam it and then you have to steam and then cook? Or? Well, cauliflower, because it has a firm texture and it can dry out easily, the best way to cook it is in some sort of liquid. So you can braise it, which means cooking in liquid. So you can braise it in a pan with a veggie stock, for example, or miso or some sort of flavorful broth. And if you are going to grill it, it's important to use enough oil so that, again, it stays moist. But I would either blanch it, which means bringing water to a boil and letting it sit in the water for about 20 to 30 seconds and then taking it out and plunging it into some ice and stopping the cooking process and then grilling it, which sounds like a lot, but the idea, number one, you don't want to dry it out. And number two, you don't want to cook it and have it just taste like a crunchy piece of cauliflower because the whole point is so that it's a little more moist on the inside and then more a little caramelization or seared on the outside so okay that's a good tip because we've gone out run we've had that we've had cauliflower steak at a lot of restaurants and a lot of restaurants don't even do it right because it's hard as a rock come out yeah (laughs) hard as a rock you feel like you're eating raw cauliflower yeah yeah the purpose of what the idea of a steak is (laughs) (laughs) exactly yeah thank you for sharing that okay so back to valentine's ideas what about dessert do you have any dessert you'd want to kind of explain people could do that would be healthy and heart healthy i have several desserts in my book, Eat Like You Give a Fork, The Real Dish on Eating to Thrive, that I love, love, love. And you mentioned avocados. So I'm going to talk about this one first. I have a dark chocolate avocado mousse with raspberry coulis, which is a fancy word for a sauce. (laughs) Coconut whip, it's all vegan. Wow. So decadent and delicious. And you make the mousse in a food processor or just a high powered blender, like a Nutribullet, something like that would work. And then you make the raspberry coulis just in a little saucepan and you can buy a prepared coconut whipped cream 
to use for that, but you just layer it and it looks gorgeous. So it's very, and again, you're bringing in that red in the raspberry, which is great for your heart health, that dark chocolate with the cocoa powder, and then avocado, which is just wonderful all the way around for our health. What That's are you putting the avocado in? Are you mixing that in with the chocolate? Yeah, you pulse it in the food processor. Okay, with the cho- with when you're making the, oh, okay, yeah, because I had a chef who did a guest blog post and she had come up with avocado cupcakes and she used the avocado in the frosting to mm-hmm. give it a real creamy texture. Yeah, so that, and, oh my gosh, you could not tell. You could not no, taste avocado. avocado no, avocado works so beautifully with, chocolate so does beets by the way beets and chocolate work wonderfully too i made uh i was on a show called recipe rehab and i made a chocolate cake and took out all of the saturated fat so all the butter and all the sugar and replaced it with pureed beets i I love that yeah that is such a great tip well speaking of do you have and other healthy swaps like a lot of problems for people would be butter oil milk because so many people are lactose intolerant and cheese because I watched your recipe rehab when you did the mac and cheese and I was like I need to eat that mac and cheese now (laughs) (laughs) oh my god you used butternut squash which was so spectacular so give us a couple swaps someone listening right now is like I need to get healthy this year just give me the basics what can I swap out right away to start making before they buy your book before they yeah before they buy your book what can I do So pureeing vegetables and fruit are a great substitute for fat because fat basically acts as a moisture barrier, right? It's to keep the moisture in the food. So like I mentioned, pureed beets, pureed butternut squash, applesauce is a great replacement. Some people, of course, avocado. I've used cauliflower. So avocado is a wonderful replacement. I actually made some cupcakes with cauliflower in the frosting you just get it really soft and it's just another way to make a food more nutrient dense and keep that moisture in there so there's a lot of ways to replace the fat with your fruits and vegetables and then sneakily kind of get those nutrients especially for kids into the things that they love right i haven't used it as much but zucchini can be used in a lot of preparations i mean zucchini bread of course but I've seen brownies made with zucchini too. So yeah. wow, isn't it amazing? Well, so as, sneaky. as a general rule of thumb, you could say anytime it calls for like a lot of oil or a lot of butter, you just go to the processed pureed fruit and or veggies and substitute that. Is that kind of an in baking, definitely. Okay. Um, when sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error, and certainly there's some guidelines out there, people that have published recipes that can give you a good basis, but for me, for the most part, it's cup for cup. So oh, okay. if it's a cup of butter, you can do a cup of cooked pureed beets to substitute for that. Oh, that's amazing. Very yeah. good. It's a great way to get your beets too, because people don't really like to eat just a pile of beets. But if when it's snuck in your food, you don't even know you're eating it. So yeah. Totally. And again, <laughs> with chocolate, it's a no brainer. It right, really yeah. works beautifully and you will not taste them at all. Wow. Okay. Wow. They're just sweet. Yeah. So would you say <laughs> pumpkin? I know my sister in law puts yes. pumpkin puree in her brownies. Oh, yeah. Pumpkin, just like the butternut squash, you can interchange those. That's always a fall favorite for us. And I cook, I always have canned pumpkin in my pantry at all times, all year round. Nice. I make these protein bites and I use the pumpkin in there too, to give them some moisture with oatmeal and they're awesome. But yeah, use pumpkin. The bottom line is have fun with this. You know, I think sometimes it's a little trial and error, but I think for people to explore, sometimes you find your favorite hacks by just being creative. Right. Don't get caught in a food rut. I know everybody does. I know we have as vegans too. It's like, ah, that again, you know, even (laughs) even as even as great as the dishes, we're like, okay, we know how to make that. So we'll make that once a week. And you get really burned out on those recipes quickly. I love your tips. These are really different foods that you might not be thinking of. Lots of good variety. So uh, Chef Maria, we're gonna put you on the spot here. You know, we've all heard that oysters and chocolate are aphrodisiacs, right? Is, Is first of all, is that true? And can you share some healthy foods for our audience that are aphrodisiacs? I know you can answer this. Well, oysters are considered aphrodisiacs because they're rich in trace minerals and 
our body requires these minerals, just like what you find in chocolate too, by the way, in order to just run efficiently, right? And when we're running efficiently, we our libido is also in check too. If you're not feeling good, if you're off, obviously everything else is going to go out the window as well. So not everybody loves oysters. Some people don't like the texture of it. That can be a turnoff for other people. That's part of <laughs> yeah. the sex appeal. <laughs> right now, the only caution, and I don't mean to be a wet blanket for the people who love oysters, but oysters, they can be pretty iffy from a food safety standpoint. They have been known to carry Vibrio, which is a very serious foodborne illness and can attack the nervous system. So if you are going to eat the raw oyster, you really want to make sure that it comes from a very cold water source and that it's been kept cold, very cold. So eat with caution, proceed with caution. Is uh, yeah, I yeah, to say you, with yeah for sure. When you yeah. say that with sushi too, or any raw food, Absolutely. right? Anything is, raw, you want to yeah. make sure that it is has been handled properly, meticulously, I would say, if you're not going to cook it. Because the cooking is the kill step, right? The kill step to kill off bacteria that can be harmful and even deadly. And you want to make sure that your food has not been cross-contaminated with other proteins or even raw produce that is carrying bacteria like E. coli or salmonella. So, and again, going back to when you go to a restaurant, oftentimes you don't see what's coming out or how things have been handled. This is also part of being a cautious eater. Yeah, mm. I agree. That's very That's a true. Good tip. Now, chocolate, on the other hand, is pretty risk-free. Okay? <laughs> you can't go wrong with that, right? Yeah. yeah. You really can't win. go wrong with that unless you're <laughs> allergic to it. And if you are, I'm really sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't even think well, about we that. vegan sushi. And I'll tell you, it's so good. And if you like sushi, but you are hesitant of the parasites and all of this that you can get, vegan sushi, oh my gosh, you guys, you get the flavor because you use the seaweed. We use the coconut aminos or the tamari, whatever you use for your soy sauce. But yeah, you get that whole vibe. You get the, and then we'll put a lot of veggies like carrots and cucumber and maybe brown rice and cabbage and avocado. And you just feel like you're eating sushi. Especially with the wasabi on top of it. You feel like it's burning wasabi, them off anyway. You get the ginger, you get the whole flavor, you get the vibe. Yeah. And you know, it's still okay to eat the fish. I mean, I love sushi too. You want to know that the source is good. If you're going to make sushi at home, a tip that I would give people is buy the fish frozen because freezing in a way is also a step that helps to prevent the growth of bacteria. And a lot of vendors will sell fish. People think that they should buy it fresh, but it's actually safer to buy it. In a that is a great frozen. point. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's a great point. Yep. Yeah. Jeff Murray, you mentioned earlier, you always have pumpkin puree in your cupboard, right? So. Well, yes. What are some other must-have ingredients that listeners should have on hand to ensure they're cooking healthy and that they're doing everything they can to help themselves be safe? Yeah. Well, I think this is a great thing for people to really take a close look at their pantry because it's obvious that we should keep fresh food, right? We should always have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, fresh proteins. If you do dairy, I personally will eat whole Greek yogurt, kefir, probiotic rich foods like that. So you can have a range of those types of foods, but often we neglect what's in the pantry. The pantry can be really helpful in terms of helping to shortcut the cooking process and add flavor and bulk to our meals too, right? So canned tomato products, you actually metabolize lycopene better when a tomato is cooked. So canned tomato products are a good thing to always have. Tomato paste, canned tomatoes. You can do sun-dried tomatoes. I love the flavor of those. And that is a great way to kind of just mix up the tomato addition to your foods. So those are great things to keep. Certainly canned beans. Talking about adding moisture, you can do black beans and brownies. Yeah, we do that. We make black black bean brownies. Yeah, they're great. They're really good. Bonzo beans cannellini beans, I cook with all of those. So I always have canned beans. Buy the low sodium ones if you can, because they do use a fair amount of salt. So in the much sodium. Yeah. And, and get the BBA-free cans. 
Amy's is all BPA free and Eden Foods and look for that BPA free logo on the front of the can. It's worth the extra 10 cents or whatever you're going to pay. Definitely. What are your favorite spices, by the way? So if not including salt and pepper, what would be your next like top three or four artists or go-tos? Can I mention one more thing in the oh, pantry? Oh, sure. I- Actually, two more things in the pantry that I think are really, really useful p- for people. Canned seafood. Again, a wonderful source of omega-3s to get canned sardines and mackerel and salmon. And sometimes they're not available fresh. They're always wild caught in the can. And wild caught is always better because the animal is eating what it's supposed to. So that is a great thing to stock up on. Again, look for the BPA free. You can often find those in pouches, but I've got a bunch of recipes that use canned seafood that are delicious and just a great easy way to be able to make dinner quickly or or put together a salad. And the other canned thing that I love or packaged food that I love are packaged grains like quinoa and couscous and millet, farro, things like that, that you can pull together a meal, brown rice that round out kind of the holy trinity of macronutrients. And those are ways to keep your foods diverse and create easy convertible meals where you've got your proteins cooked off, your veggies, and then you can put a grain with it. So those are great things to always keep in your pantry. Those are great tips. What would be the biggest no-no like that people are doing wrong? We talked a lot about oils on this show, hydrogenated oils and things like that. What would you think that's it? Or is there something else that stop using dot, dot, dot? Well, I think oil is definitely one. And the way you use oil, canola oil has become really prominent and prevalent in a lot of foods. And the sources of canola oil is not always very clean. So I think it's important to try and source when you can organic oils because they're being produced without synthetic additives or pesticides. And anytime a food is processed, so it's in an oil form, it's being processed, right? And there can be synthetic processes in the creation of those oils. So that and opting for cold pressed oil where there's no heat used so that they're not becoming oxidized or, you know, kind of going through that synthetic process. I think oils are really important. I also think this is more of a texture flavor thing, but please don't mistake canned spinach for fresh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah canned is good sometimes with some foods, not all, right? <laughs> canned works for some things like canned corn is okay. You know, it's okay. Canned spinach? No, it's no. not. Well, I'll, I, I'll tell you, when I was- made that growing up. Well, I, asked, I, I asked for it as a four-year-old because I, I watched the Popeye cartoon and I literally thought that if I <laughs> ate that, I asked my mom to buy it, that I would have huge muscles. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you were the only one. It Ron. took about 20 years, but I did it eventually, but it didn't happen right away like Popeye when I'm joking. So when you, when you, <laughs> ate, when you ate the can, and I know it's an old cartoon, but I must've been at my grandparents' house watching something. You're dating you know, yourself. And I think what ends up happening, just like with canned beets, for example, I- hear people tell me all the time, beets are terrible. And I'm like, yeah, well, the texture changes completely when you can an item. So think about that. And in many cases, frozen foods are more readily available. Now you can find so many different varieties that are frozen that the quality of the food is so much better than buying it canned. So that's more of aesthetic versus a safety thing. But I definitely think it can be a turnoff if that's what you're used to. But yes. You know, See, this is palate. where certain foods got a bad rap because our parents made these canned things and we we're like, oh, I hate spinach or I hate beets. But when you try the fresh one, I would totally agree. It's a whole world different because yes. I love spinach now, but I hated it when I was little. But ew, the canned, you know? Ugh. Yeah. 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 No. And I want to add to this buying organic food. There was a peer reviewed study that just came out that found glyphosate, which is the herbicide that's in now bear owned. Monsanto's, it used to be Monsanto bear owned. And it's in Roundup. Which Roundup, is thank you. I couldn't think of the word. Glyphosate, which is an ingredient in Roundup. So for those that were on an organic diet, the glyphosate levels, which is a cancer causing chemical, likely to be cancer causing, dropped 70%. So I know some people go, oh, organic so expensive, but we're talking about your health. You're investing in your health. I think of it like your vitamin or your mineral every time you're paying a little extra for that fresh food that you talked about or that organic food. Yeah. And I believe that you kind of invest in your health now or you pay for it later. And 
I fully realize that fruits and vegetables, they should be the cornerstone for everybody. Half your plate should be fruits and vegetables, whether you're vegan or an omnivore, it really doesn't matter. And sometimes organic produce is not always available. That's why we created Eat Cleaner, our product line, our fruit and vegetable wash. It's lab proven to remove up to 99.9% of that harmful pesticide. Nice. Shout out to that. Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah. So always better to buy organic because it's more sustainable and it's better for the soil. And our soil health is absolutely crucial for the health of the food and the health of our planet. But if those foods are not available, and even if you are buying organic, it's still important to wash them properly, especially if you're eating them raw to avoid foodborne illness. About 48 million people get sick from food every year in the US alone. And half of those foodborne illness causing foods are fresh produce items. It's crazy, right? I know you think you're doing such a good job. It's happened around and I were like, what? We're eating so healthy and we're eating organic. How do you get? But of course, there's bacteria. Yeah, even vegetables like greens, They have a lot of crevices and if they're grown near runoff or there's a conventional farm near an organic farm and there's runoff, I mean, there can be flyover contaminants. I mean, there's a lot of ways food can be contaminated from field. And we don't wash anything with water alone, right? We don't wash our hair, our car, our dishes, our dog. (laughs) That's a good point. That's the exterior of us. Yeah. 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 That's so great. I'll put a link to your product. So Chef Maria, where can our audience find more recipes and healthy options and your book, Eat Like You Give a Fork, The Real Dish on Eating to Thrive? Everything is on our website at eatcleaner.com. You'll find a lot of food for thought. You'll find links to recipes and blogs and podcast episodes and videos. I mean, it really is a wealth of resources. And you'll also find our award-winning products the book. You'll find some fun little accessory items. We have some great aprons. I want to send you guys some aprons. Oh, wow. That will inspire me to help out more in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I've been and you can inspect part. it later. One will be dirty. One will be clean. We'll yeah. Be clean. <laughs> <laughs> but your videos are fantastic. I think it's one thing to read a recipe, but watching you cook it, I learned better that way, I think. And your videos were really, I mean, your mac and cheese, if I didn't mention it, her, it was vegan. It was a total vegan mac and cheese. And whoa, some of the ingredients, I won't say, I'll put a link to it, will surprise you what she put in there. And it won, you won. It was a contest. That show was really fun because it kind of brought this whole concept to mainstream America, not just people who were into their health and wellness. It was on daytime television, on the weekend, on ABC. And we took family recipes that were full of sugar and saturated fat and not so great ingredients and just made them a hundred times better. And the families got to cook them and really adopt them as their own. So I think it opened up our minds and our palates a little bit. We can really open up the world. Okay, and that was called Recipe Rehab, correct? Yeah, Yeah. what a cute concept and so amazing because I'm sure a lot of the families that you worked with were like, what? I had no idea I could make this meal healthier and taste even better, probably in most cases. Yeah, that episode with the chocolate cake, I remember the host, Danny Bohm, was like, beef, I just heard everybody across America drop their forks. (laughs) (laughs) Right. How clever. For sure. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us, Jeff Moria. We really appreciate you. We love the work you do. Love all the tips. I can't wait to go to watch your videos later and make all these wonderful recipes you talked about for Valentine's Day. I can't wait to eat them all. I can't wait to eat them all. (laughs) Thank you guys. And thank you so much for championing healthy lifestyle, a toxic free lifestyle, because this is such an important part of being a responsible eater. (laughs) And from the pans we use to the products we use to packaging, I mean, it really goes without saying like we have to be educated about our choices so thank you for furthering that oh thank you for saying that i appreciate that and right you don't want to eat all this healthy food and then turn around and put slap on toxic personal care or use toxic cookware and things like that so it is like we say it's a healthy lifestyle it's not just one aspect of your life it's all aspects so as jillian michaels said i only eat healthy food and i only want healthy love we couldn't agree more jillian 
friends, thank you for joining us today. And Chef Maria, thank you. We are ready to don our aprons and get cooking. Yes, and don't forget to head to ronalisa.com forward slash podcast now to get all the links and recipes that we discussed in today's shows, including the show notes, and have a very happy and healthy Valentine's Day, everyone. See you next week. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Chef Maria. Bye. Thank you, guys. This episode of the Healthy Home Hacks podcast has ended, but be sure to subscribe for more healthy living strategies and tactics to help you create the healthy home you've always dreamed of. And don't forget to rate and review so we can continue to bring you the best content. See you on the next episode.